um, roles of private, public and civil society institutions in bridging the digital divide. Um, we've, we've got quite a interesting group of people assembled here today to talk about different things. Um, I'm just going to introduce things um, a little bit. So um, we've long been aware of the digital divide. It's been something that's been discussed in meetings like this um, for at least the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and by the digital divide, we're talking about the gap between those who have access to digital technologies and those who do not. The COVID-19 pandemic that we're all experiencing at the moment has drawn into starker contrast the ability of those with access to connectivity and sufficient skills to access um, extremely important things um, in their lives, um, both to, in relation to the, the pandemic um, and also just in, in relation to running your, your, um, your normal lives. So things like um, the ability to get tested for COVID-19. A lot of countries, you need to do all of the booking online, access information about it online. Um, if uh, with the schools being closed in so many locations, um, we're becoming more and more um, reliant on internet connectivity and digital tools for keeping our children educated, um, making sure that they uh, they continue to, uh, to to thrive and and learn, um, so that you know as they grow up, they're they're able to um, pay a full part in society. Um, it's become um, a means for us to communicate with our our loved ones. Um, you know, um, face to face. Meetings are becoming more difficult, have become very difficult. So we, we are using digital technologies to keep those connections up with the people that matter to us the most. And as we will all um, be experiencing today, um, we are using um, digital technologies um, such as uh, video conferencing um, in our jobs and in, in our livings. Um, so I think you know, we now see how digital technology and internet connectivity is absolutely central to our lives. In the past, it's often been assumed that the digital divide was something that was geographic, that happened between rich countries and poor countries. But I think the COVID-19 pandemics illustrated that actually the divide exists within all countries, between the rich and poor of the countries, people that are living in urban areas and rural areas, those who are educated and non-educated, and between age groups, there's cultural differences that uh, contributes to differences in access. So I think, I think you know, everybody that's uh, participating in this meeting today is probably um, very comfortable with the concept of the digital divide. Um, so today we've got a panel of people who are all in some way involved in expanding the access to digital technologies through different aspects of communication technology. Um, I'd like to welcome our panel. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourselves, so starting with Gennaro. Hi Duncan, thank you for having me. Uh, Gennaro Cruz from the GSMA. Thanks Gennaro. Uh, Fatima. Hi everyone, my name is Fatima Kothari and I lead program management and operations for Microsoft's Airband initiative, which is focused on um, the broadband gap. I am based out in Seattle. Okay, uh, and uh, Olu. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Olu Olutola. I'm a regional connectivity and digital advisor for USAID. Nice to be here. Thanks Olu. Uh, and finally, Onika. Hello, Eva. Hola, you, Anika, you're, uh, you've, you've muted yourself. I think we can probably hear you now. Great. Uh, sorry, my, my screen just froze for a minute. Uh, my name is Onika Makwakwa. I am the Africa Lead for the Alliance for Affordable Internet, an initiative of the World Wide Web Foundation, and I'm based out of Johannesburg. Thanks very much, Onika. So starting with Gennaro, Gennaro, perhaps you can talk us about some of the work, um, some of the things that GSMA has been up to in this area. 
Yes, thank you, Duncan. I would like to share with you just uh, one presentation. Just give me one second. And uh, for those that uh, do not know the GSMA, we are the trade association for mobile operators worldwide. So there's more than 700 operators that are part of, of our organizations. And we've been working on closing the digital divide for uh, a while now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So I'll be very brief um, and in explaining how we see uh, connectivity at the GSMA. So first of all, uh, we thought it was very important to size the problem. And uh, according to our research, there is about 4 billion people that remain unconnected. Now, there is uh, a way of looking at this, uh, what we call the connectivity gap. Uh, we split it in two types of gaps, what we call the coverage gap and what we call the usage gap. And it's very important to make this distinction because the actions that are required to close these gaps are rather different. So if you look at the, at the graph on the right, uh, we see the evolution of this connectivity gap over the last five years. So we have in blue those who are connected. Those are people that are connected to the internet. And today we, um, we estimate that there is about 3.8 billion people that use mobile internet to connect to the internet. As you know, in uh, low and middle income countries, mobile is the main way of, of connecting to the internet. Then we have in yellow what it's what we call the usage gap. And these are the people who are covered by a mobile broadband network, and we mean 3G or 4G networks, but which are not using the internet. And this usage gap is very important because this is really demand side barriers that are preventing people from using mobile networks or the mobile internet that is available around them. And finally, we have uh, what we call the coverage gap, which we have in gray. Um, and this is about 600 million today. And these are the people that are not living within the coverage or that are not covered by a mobile broadband network, so 3G or 4G network. So it's very important to make the distinct uh, to distinguish these two because, as I was saying, the, the actions that are required both from the different stakeholders it can be the private sector, the public sector or, or, or civil society are really different. And I'm going to discuss those in, in, in one second. What it's important to see here is that if we look at 2019, so the last bar to the right, we see that there are 600 million people not covered but around 3.4 billion people who are covered by a mobile broadband network but are not using mobile internet. This means that the usage gap is approximately six times larger than the coverage gap. And this is really important, right? Because here what we are seeing, the, the latest trends, and you can see this in the evolution of, of the connectivity gap over the last five years, is that it is really the demand side that is suffering. We see that there has been a lot of investment in infrastructure, but it's really on the uptake of services where we need to now press on and take action to, to get people uh, online. So moving on into the, into the barriers. So we, we have done quite a lot of research at the GSMA on, on, on this aspect, on what are the barriers that are preventing people from getting online. So we have uh, come with five barriers that summarize or that cover all of the different issues that we have uh, encountered. Um, the first one is, is access. And access is, of course, access to a network. So having, for example, the coverage of a 3G or 4G network, but also access to handsets, uh, access to electricity, access in terms of having an ID to be able to purchase uh, both uh, data plans and, and, and devices. So this is really the, 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 the first barrier that, that users face when, when trying to access uh, mobile internet and get digital included. Uh, a second one is, uh, of course, affordability. Uh, so improving the affordability of handsets and, and, and data uh, plans is very important. So people that, especially in, in, in countries where available income is, is uh, very low. The third one we have is relevance, uh, and this one is, is, is often overlooked, but it's really important according to our research. And this is really about ensuring that the content 
the services that are available in, in, in low and middle low and middle income countries are relevant for the people that want to access them. If someone is not inspired to get online, they will not do it because they don't see any value for them on doing so. The fourth one is the knowledge and skills. So this is really about having the digital skills and literacy to be able to access uh, mobile internet services, right? We see a lot of take up in mobile um, mobile services such as SMS and and voice services. But when you go online, uh, you need a different set of skills, and this is a, a major barrier in, in many countries. And finally, safety and security. Uh, this is really about tackling some of the issues that come with the with getting online, harassment, theft, fraud, these, these issues that are becoming ever more prominent and creating a fear barrier for people getting online. So I will move uh, to my last slide just to say that we believe at the GSMA that in order to get people online, we need to have projects and interventions that are really comprehensive of all these issues if we want to, to really to succeed. So very quickly, just to give you an example of one project that we had, an innovation fund that we did in Ghana and Uganda. So for, for Ghana, what we did is really give, uh, um, we did an RFP to get innovations on what would be the technologies that could reach rural areas in order to uh, cut the cost of providing connectivity. We partner with local operators, in this case, Vodafone Ghana, to ensure that there is a commercial viability of this, of this pilot. And this is very important in order to achieve a scale if we prove that, that these technologies can provide connectivity technically viable, then we need to prove that the commercial case is there. We also work with the government, so the Universal Service Fund Agency, in order to select the right locations, but also uh, there was um, direct involvement in terms of reducing some of the tariff, some of the taxes on the equipment, and reducing some of the red tape to deploy some of these sites in rural areas. And finally, now that the sites are deployed, we are planning to uh, do a digital skills training to really increase adoption. So this is just, I'll stop there, but this is just an example of how we see things at the GSMA in terms of being able to tackle all those barriers if we really want to, to have an impact in terms of of adoption uh, and take up of mobile internet. So Duncan, I'll stop there. Uh, if you uh, have any questions, please put them on the chat and we'll have time to, to answer them uh, later on. Thanks, Gennaro. Yeah, Gennaro. That's, um, the, the, the barriers that, that you categorized was uh, particularly interesting. I think you know, we perhaps focus a lot on the challenges around access um, and the, some of the other ones, which you could say are cultural or economic, are, um, you know, they, they, they're also very critical. And as you pointed out, there's this a difference between the coverage gap and the usage gap. And yes, we've made huge inbounds on the coverage gap, um, but the usage gap has only shifted by a very uh, small number, percentage over the years. So super, super interesting. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to hand over to Fatima now from Microsoft to talk a little bit about um, their work in this area. All right, thank you. Um, so, as I mentioned, my name is Fatima and I lead program management and operations for Microsoft's Airband initiative. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Airband today. I'm excited to share a little bit about our work and hopefully also provide some food for thought about the role of partnerships in bridging the digital divide. So Microsoft was really founded on this idea that democratizing access to technology would enable more people to reach their full potential. In July 2017, Microsoft launched Airband initiative, both as a call to action, as well as a programmatic effort to help close the broadband access gap and deliver on our company's core mission to empower communities to achieve more. For many of us, high-speed internet access is as ubiquitous as electricity, as running water, and this connectedness has fostered growth in our educational institutions, our economies, and our governments. 
But when you look at it as a global population, we've not all benefited equally. If you look at the data, nearly half of the pop world's population still does not use the internet. And only 57% of global households have an in-home internet subscription. In addition, the UN State of Broadband report found that broadband adoption or usage has actually slowed down and progress is especially elusive in income challenge areas in rural areas across the globe. So through Microsoft's Airband initiative, we work on a partnership model where we partner with telecom equipment makers, we partner with internet and energy access providers and local entrepreneurs to make affordable broadband access a reality for unserved communities around the world. Within the US, our partners are projected to cover at least 3 million people who do not have uh, broadband access in rural areas by July 2022. And through our international platform, partnerships were projected to extend internet connectivity to at least 40 million people by July 2022. This isn't an initiative that we do on our own by any means. We're, we're you know, Microsoft is not going to become a connectivity provider. We do this through a network of people all working towards the same goal, which is connecting people and bringing with that connectivity the opportunity for a better life. Our partnerships with internet service providers or ISPs are the cornerstone of the Airband Initiative. And to deliver cost-effective broadband access to these unserved areas, we support our ISP partners in leveraging a mix of technologies with the goal to both reduce the initial capital as well as the ongoing operating cost of the networks. We're also doubling down on unleashing the power of connectivity to enable digital transformation by leaning into four key areas, healthcare, agriculture, education, and small business enablement or rural entrepreneurship. And over the last three years, we made significant progress against our goals since launch. We provided access through our partnerships to over 16 million people outside of the US. So circling back to our topic of interest today, which is around the role of private, public, and civil society in bridging the digital divide, I wanna highlight our ISP partner in Kenya, Mabingu Networks. So in response to COVID-19, Mavingu Networks is collaborating on a project with the Laikipia County to provide connectivity to health clinics that have previously lacked internet access across rural Kenya. In addition to connecting the clinics, Mavingu is also coordinating with local officials to develop an inventory management system to monitor the clinic's medical supplies and is also implementing solutions to support telehealth and telemedicine with remote patients. Along with Microsoft, funding from development institutions is also going to provide external uh, additional support for digital skills that will train these healthcare workers at the clinics. So public private partnerships like these that allow for creativity while operating with a sense of urgency and a holistic focus on connectivity and the meaningful benefits and impact of the connectivity that leads to solutions is what's going to lead to sustainable, scalable, long-term solutions, solutions that last long after the pandemic is hopefully forgotten. With that, I do want to thank you for your time today. To learn a little bit more about the Airband Initiative, we've come a long way and our commitment to work to ensure ubiquitous access to broadband is stronger than ever. Together with our partners, we hope to impact the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in the coming years by delivering broadband access and improving livelihoods in those rural communities as well as urban communities. And to learn more, definitely feel free to reach out to me directly. That's it, thank you.
Thanks, Fatima. That's um, a great example of uh, Microsoft coming in um, and tackling the both the technology side, but some of the, the cultural um, sides. Um, it's, uh, it, it's good to see that you've definitely included the skills in your in your project in, in Kenya um, and you know that it's focused through the whole uh, range of digital um, activities that, that people might have from getting connected through to what they're actually trying to achieve each day. So thanks thanks very much for that. Um, Olu, I um, wonder if you can uh, bring bring the perspective of uh, USAID to uh, to this to this issue. No, um, thanks very much. I mean, this is a this is really good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are in part of the world. And I'm very glad to be part of this conversation, most especially um, talking on connectivity and, and partnership, which is basically at the core of what USAID um, does. And I couldn't agree more with, with um, General and Fatima, especially with the presentation you made, especially looking at the barriers and also making sure that, you know, I mean, this is not something um, MNOs can can you know, can do alone in terms of bridging the digital divide, but, you know, there needs to be some sort of partnership. So I'm going to be talking more about, you know, USA's perspective, especially when it comes to partnerships and also some of the things we've been able to do in the past couple of years. Um, and I'm really glad with, with the um, with the WGDP I just mentioned, um, this is something we're really also looking at. So um, USA's approach um, to, to partnership in, in digital development is in line with a USA's digital strategy that was launched in April of 2020 that amongst other things focuses on fostering open, inclusive and secure digital ecosystems in the countries where we work. And in addition um, to, to what Fatmi mentioned, especially with the uh, WGDP, USAID in the past has worked uh, with a couple of private sector players and government in bridging um, the digital divide through building of metro fiber networks and also expanding connectivity in, in rural areas, and I'll, I'll, I'll name a few. In the wake of the war, USAID launched a series of investments um, to improve um, internet connectivity, and in partnership with um, CISQUED, which is a consortium including Google, Mitsui, and IFC, USAID invested in 200 kilometers of met, uh, middle mile metro fiber to create a shared network backbone in Monrovia, which is the capital city of, uh, of Liberia. This access, um, this expanded access to affordable, high quality internet and provided enormous impact on economy, um, health and learning outcomes, ultimately leading to greater self-reliance in, 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 in Liberia. Secondly, um, to meet the unique challenges of um, connecting rural communities, we also partnered with a ranch to expand affordable, reliable and sustainable internet um, internet access through telecom tower expansion, particularly in, in remote areas to facilitate the work of locations that advance development, um, development outcomes. So these two partnerships I have just mentioned has helped to expand internet access and its benefits, which is basically giving more people a voice, strengthening communities and creating a new economic opportunities in the local, in the local ISP sector. So I'll pause there uh, for questions and um, follow up with um, other deals. Thanks, Olu, for um, some some great examples of what uh, USAID's doing and, and your approach. And um, I think you probably support um, many of the programs that target the barriers that Gennaro has um, outlined for us. So you know, thanks from the uh, from from the uh, the. Um, development community for for U to USAID for for that. Um, I'd like to now bring in uh, Onika from the Affordable Internet um, Coalition. Um, Onika, you you were um, clearly uh, very focused on one particular barrier that uh, that Gennaro mentioned, the affordability. So yeah, looking forward to uh, to hear what you have to say. Well, Nokia, you're you're still on mute. Let's see. Yeah, can hear you now. Happens to me all the time. Thanks. Okay, 
Great. Um, so the Alliance for Affordable Internet is uh, the broadest based coalition of technology companies from both the private sector, public sector, as well as civil society that is solely focused on working towards uh, ensuring uh, policies that enable access to affordable uh, and meaningful uh, internet. So our focus is mainly on policy and regulatory environments. So that some of the things that uh, we, we've, oh, some of them that we've heard about even in the projects, examples that we've had, uh, we are looking to ensure that there's sustainable uh, change in ensuring that, uh, you know, there is uh, broader access to affordability. Uh, for people that uh, we are seeking connectivity for. So how we actually work is that uh, we have country countries where we are directly engaged and we pull together a coalition of private sector players who include mobile operators, tech companies. We also bring in government, um, you know, the departments of ICTs as well as regulators, as well as civil society, uh, where we jointly work on specific policies. So a good example would be a national broadband uh, plan. Uh, the most recent one that we've done uh, was for Nigeria, where the coalition focused on making sure that there is proper broad-based consultation uh, and input into uh, the national broadband plan. Uh, so, and, and the national broadband plans are actually really important because this is where governments actually set their strategy, the policy that speaks to connecting uh, everyone in the country, but also sets the targets of how they are going to actually be able to uh, meet uh, this connectivity. And uh, so the coalition has been a really great place for us to bring in all of these key players who are concerned about affordability uh, on the access uh, for the internet so that they together work towards ensuring that, uh, you know, there is a role for everyone to play and that the changes that we bring are actually uh, sustainable and not just uh, kind of one-time promotional uh, type changes. So, um, you know, Gerano from GSMA mentioned a lot about how it's important to actually also go beyond just infrastructure. So an example of some of the working groups uh, that we have is uh, working groups that really focus also on, on research. Because one of the challenges in this area is that we don't really uh, always have good data to be able to have uh, some evidence-based research that helps us inform the policies uh, and regulations that we need uh, to recommend. Uh, it's important, especially for civil society, uh, to also be part of this uh, of this work, and we've actually found great participation from civil society as well as tech companies, of course, uh, in ensuring that we are really all uh, together working towards um, making sure that we reach universal service. Private sector companies uh, many tend to focus on the infrastructure and deployment side, but we find that partnering with civil society, for example, means that some of the demand side issues that Gennaro was talking about around skills development uh, and relevance in terms of relevant content are actually articulated in some of these uh, conversations. And uh, just to kind of give you a picture of just the importance of ensuring that everyone has a role, that the, the importance of just this multi-stakeholder partnership in working on uh, closing the digital divides. About 150 million people are estimated that uh, they will be pushed to extreme poverty in 2021 due to COVID-19. And if there's ever a moment uh, to really uh, help us understand the importance of this issue, it's, it's now more than ever. And uh, according to UNESCO, 1.3 billion learners were actually experienced school or university interruption uh, during the time when we were dealing with uh, COVID-19. Meanwhile, about only 51% of individuals are actually using the internet globally. And in Africa, that number is even lower. So if there's ever a moment for us to realize the gravity of, um, the, of connecting everyone, that moment is now. And when we look, especially in terms of who is mostly offline right now, it's mostly the poor, it's women, uh, it's people who could 
benefit, who stand to benefit the most by being able to have access uh, in, in terms of being able to use access to the internet meaningfully uh, to be able to change their lives. And so for us, uh, working in a multi-stakeholder coalition with both private sector that understands these issues, as well as civil society that knows the impact on the ground, is really important so that we are making sure that uh, all of the work that we are doing, especially as we measure even with the affordability report, that we are actually highlighting uh, the importance of meeting the UN target. Uh, and then this target, by the way, was actually developed through this same uh, process of multi-stakeholder uh, coalition. And, and this target is basically states that one gig of data uh, should cost us no more than 2% of average monthly income. But I'm sure all of us in here can agree also that one gig of um, data per month is barely enough to get us to the kind of transformative and meaningful connectivity that we are looking for. And so uh, there's a greater need, uh, as it has been identified, that even more investment is needed. I, I believe the World Bank says about 106 billion rands is needed for Africa to be able to connect everyone. And if private sector meets about half of that, there's still a role for government to play in there and a role for civil society. And so I think for us, the biggest issue is, you know, really around uh, ensuring that we have affordable and meaningful access in a way that's sustainable by making sure that all the voices uh, participate in getting us to that goal. Thank you. I forgot to turn on my microphone there. Thank you so much, Anika. Um, I think you know you you're uh, doing some really important work um, in highlighting the issue of affordability, which I think is you know it's a very uh, critical barrier for people um, gaining access. Um, and I'd like now just to sort of um, think a little bit about the the different barriers that Gennaro um, raised in in his talk. Um, the, the barriers of access, affordability, relevance, knowledge and skills, and safety and security. Um, Gennaro, I have a question for you around that. Um, I think, you know, we, we, everybody's known about uh, the access challenge, and as you've shown in your, in your charts, that that's shrank, you know, the most quickly over the years. Um, with the, uh, the rest of the usage gap, um, what would you say, you know, have you done any research into what are the critical barriers in there? Like, you know, is, is one more important than the other or are they all equal? Yes, thank you, Duncan. This is, this is a very good question because at some point if we want to tackle the issues, we need to give priorities. So I would say they're all important. But um, according to our research, uh, these barriers are all present but not necessarily to the same extent in every region. So in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we know that affordability and skills are uh, the main barriers that, that uh, prevent people from getting online. If you uh, discuss uh, Latin America, we see that affordability, but also safety and security becomes a much more important issue as well. So, um, and what we, what we have seen is as we've been working in, in, in um, in the field is that as soon as you solve one of the barriers, then the other one is, is waiting just behind it, right? So you need to, to have a comprehensive approach. Just uh, one thing that is very important in the in the access one is there is the part of the infrastructure, with, as we discussed, this has been less of an issue lately, but you have also access to devices, and this remains the key uh, problem. Access to smartphones, is uh, perhaps one of the most prominent barriers, uh, access in terms of being available, but, but especially the price of, of smartphones. So, um, so this remains an, an issue, even if the infrastructure is, is there. Thanks, thanks, Gennaro. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's really interesting that you've got some geographic um, measurements around those barriers, and perhaps um, that's a really useful resource that maybe um, other people working in this space can take advantage of um, when they come to designing digital divide addressing projects. We will make um, sure to share some of that material so that uh, participants can can access those documents and, and, and can ask questions after. Sure. Um, Alu, um, that, that mainly, so we had a question about um, 
how uh, USAID identifies um, priority countries for infrastructure projects um, from uh, from from Frank. Um, sorry, I, I didn't get your whole name noted down, Frank, but uh, thanks for that question. Olu, um, that's clearly um, somebody you know, hoping that USAID um, is funding infrastructure projects. Is there something that, that you get involved with? Are you addressing the, the, uh, the coverage gap? Absolutely, and I think I responded to to Frank, but just um, just to say it over here again, I think you know one of the things USAID has been uh, has been doing in the last couple of years has basically been working with um, with um, host governments and also mobile network operators within the um, countries where we do uh, where we do work. So basically, I mean, a, a short term, uh, long term goal is basically to foster an open, inclusive, and secure digital ecosystem, which also looks into ways we can bridge the, the digital divide. So basically, I mean, we've gotten requests from a lot of countries in terms of being able to support them in the, in the journey to, I mean, in bridging this digital divide. And I'm also happy Onika is here, because I mean, I work with Onika very well in, in, in Liberia when we started the whole process of um, um, the, the metro fiber and also with the ICT policy, just, uh, just like she, she mentioned. But to kind of like, you know, just touch on, on, on something Janera mentioned, I think, you know, looking at some of the, um, the barriers um, we see in Sub-Saharan Africa today, um, you know, in as much as I know that, you know, affordability is still a problem in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think one of the biggest challenges in Sub-Saharan Africa is still the digital infrastructure. When, we when I talk about the digital infrastructure, I'm talking about the middle mile. So I'm talking about like, you know, the back all infrastructure to support um, M and I mean, to support ISPs, um, to kind of like get, you know, um, to get connectivity to the last mile, mostly when you know that the M and will probably not, you know, go to areas where they probably won't see any profit. So how to kind of bridge that? And so those are some of the things, you know, USA looks at at this point, and not just, you know, building a back hall or backbone, but how we can actually open it up for, for other players to actually come in and provide it to the last mile. Thanks, Solu. I, I mean that. So um, Judith um, in the chat just raised the uh, the definition of meaningful connectivity that a um, a, a, a for AI um, had come up with, and that that's a that's a really uh, interesting thing. So you know, talking about why are we putting the internet into into people's lives? That's you know maybe addresses the relevance um, barrier. Um, Onika, I wonder um, if. If, if if you can say a little bit about this definition. You're, you're, sorry, on, Onika, it was a question for you, but you're on mute again. Onika, I think you're still on mute. Muted, unmute. I can hear you now. Excellent. Okay, it worked. Okay, great. So um, yes, we we actually have um, a paper on our website on meaningful connectivity, and we are continuously working and engaging partners around setting a target for that. And so for now, I would say that we would define meaningful access as having regular access, uh, meaning daily internet use, uh, being able to have a suitable device to, to access the internet, such as a smartphone, and uh, being able to have enough data, uh, such as unlimited broadband access point, as well as a fast connection, 4G connection at minimum. Uh, if, we, if we want people to have the kind of access that, you know, is daily meaningful where they can take courses, they can really use the internet beyond just um, social platforms to, to really help transform their lives. And I'll put the link uh, of the Meaningful Connectivity uh, paper here, which is still uh, also open for comments. I think that, that okay. that's that's fantastic, Onika. I think that's that's really important to define these things because it's so easy to focus in on one area of access, which might be just having the infrastructure, um, but it, it, it's much more than that. 
isn't it? It's, it's access to devices and um, it's just, you know the other things that you've outlined. Um, we had a couple of questions related to to big tech's role. So um, Fatima, you're 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 here as uh, the only representative from what we might call big tech, uh, but not quite the same um, kind of organisation as, uh, as 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 some of the big internet companies. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we, we had a point there about um, how some big tech companies um, such as Facebook are um, offering services like Facebook Basics, um, which I think you know, is, is a way of, of providing a certain level of, of access to people um, at low or no cost, um, possibly as a way of um, increasing the, the number of people that have access to their tools. Um, is Microsoft involved in, uh, in in any projects like this, uh, sort of subsidised access? Oh, Fatima, sorry, you're, you're, it's your turn to be on mute now. <laughs> I guess everyone has to go through it, right? Just providing support to Annika. Um, in terms of in terms of when we think about um, internet access that is provided to the end user. Microsoft as well as Airban, we don't provide the service directly to end users. When we think about making access affordable, the way we think about it is for, through our partnership model. So for instance, if we have an internet service provider that we have a partnership with, we try to reduce their cost model and their operating expenses. So that helps them reduce their service pricing that they offer to the end users. But you know, Microsoft does not directly subsidize uh, the service for the end user. Similarly, on the device side, we have partnerships in place that offer subsidized devices to the end user. But when it comes to like uh, providing direct access to the devices. There's some programs in place at Microsoft that already do do that, but we're we're still kind of early on in our roadmap on that um, uh, on the devices side of it. Thanks, Fatima. Um, so yes, yeah, so the the questions are coming in quite quickly now. Um, so we we had a, a follow up um, question to Frank's um, about collaboration or partnership with local civil society organizations that, uh, that maybe have a, a greater understanding of local challenges. Um, yes, you're, 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 all, um, you're all from quite large global organizations, but how do we, uh, how do we get into the, the local situation? Um, I wonder um, if I can go back to you, Gennaro, about this. Yes, thank you, Duncan. Uh, this, is, this is a very important um, point that is raised here, the role of uh, civil society, uh, grassroots organization, local organizations. Um, the way we see it is that it it comes mainly on the on the relevance part, right? There's one part which is knowledge of the market and on the specific buyers. So there's a part on, on, on sharing knowledge there that it's important, but also only the local ecosystem and local companies and local entrepreneurs and, and, and NGOs know what people really care about locally, right? And can create services that are uh, relevant or content that is relevant. And uh, so really partnering with them in terms of providing the tools, creating the, the, the right uh, digital ecosystem for these uh, local uh, you know, organizations to deliver their value online digitally, that will generate usage that will generate uh, you know, people wanting to be uh, online. And this will create a virtual cycle, right? Because there is more usage, so there is more uh, commercial interest for companies also to deploy uh, more infrastructure, right? So this is what really gets uh, kind of this, this virtual cycle, cycle going. So, so there is definitely a very important role for local organizations, both in terms of sharing their experience, but most importantly, into creating a dynamic um, local ecosystem and, and relevant for, for local uh, people. Annika, um, as, as you're a, an alliance, um, I wonder whether you know, is, is this something that um, local organizations might get involved with? 
Yes, certainly. Um, Okay, thanks. Oh, you've gone on mute, Anika. <laughs> well, Anika, I think your computer is conspiring against you to put you on uh, on mute when you're not expecting it. Well, while we wait for Anika to come back off uh, mute, uh, one thing that I did want to do is plus one Hennaro's point, Gennaro's point about you know ensuring that each program and making sure there's a component that is designed with local conditions and social norms in mind is critical to actually increasing the adoption of the service that is being deployed. I think uh, you know when we think about the approach at urban side, we think about it as a tree legs tool across access, across adoption, and across application and without any one of those legs of the stool it kind of like is something that's not going to be sustainable long term. Annika I don't know if you're able to come off mute and uh... no I can I can also I can also um, plus one what you said um, for Tim I think it's really important to have some sort of a um, local implementation, um, making sure like the role of the civil society, it's more of a watchdog role. Um, basically, you know, the concept of um, bridging bridging the digital divides. And I think, you know, when when I when I think through um, what the civil society, how how they can actually help out in this space, I, I think they can play a very significant role uh, as a proactive agent in in different. Um, sectors and, and levels of, 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 of a new economy and to help developing countries achieve um, e-readiness through public policy, um, accountability and ensuring citizens have um, access to the basic internet services. Yep. And I think I think like, you know, the simplest way I could kind of think of it as like if 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 it's if there's a community or an organization that is going to make use of or benefit from the connectivity, they need to have a place at the table. Absolutely, Fatima. I think, um, sorry, we, uh, unfortunately we seem to have lost Onika. Um, I think she maybe was having some trouble with her connectivity. Um, and, and that's a shame because we had a really interesting question about the role of regulatory um, agencies and government in, uh, in in enabling connectivity, um, pas partially to do with the level of taxation in some locations. So we had um, we had Agaba talking about the uh, taxation situation in in DRC um, and and how this um, had inflated the cost of connectivity um, in that location. Um, I think you know there's a very wide uh, wide range of, uh, of of challenges. So, um, Janera, I'm I'm really really um, grateful for you to, for having uh, having simplified this for us into into the, that list of barriers. Um, although I think you know it will take um, concerted effort to address every single one of those from uh, from people in, from different different sectors. Um, um, but it's it, it's a fabulous framework to uh, to start addressing this uh, in in a way that takes us beyond the technology um, and into that usage gap. Yeah, yeah, no, and and what you mentioned in terms of the role of the government and the role of regulator, this is really key to move forward, and it's some it's something that uh, we work a lot at the GSMA. We do capacity building, we create also we do research to try to have some evidence based policy decision making and um, and the, the regulator really uh, the government they really play a role in all of these barriers that we mentioned right on the access part on the infrastructure is mostly about investment and, and you know, the spectrum and, and, and kind of the all these barriers for creating an, an investment friendly framework uh, but also in the other in the usage uh, or demand side barriers that we mentioned the regulator also plays a key role right and you mentioned affordability is one of the key ones uh, we see a lot of different taxes going into the digital sector um, there's a number of reasons why that happens 
but um, this is really at odds sometimes with the goals uh, that governments themselves they have. Right? Sometimes you see these uh, national uh, digital strategies that are very ambitious, but at the same time, if you tax, uh, you know, the, the investments, but also uh, tax the the usage. So you create these barriers, right, for, for the development of the sector. So it's really important for governments to align the regulatory and their policy framework with their own ambitions if, if we want to uh, to create a, a more enabling environment. I mean, I wonder whether the current pandemic situation has, has maybe shifted the view uh, around connectivity that um, perhaps a lot of people had viewed it as, uh, as a bit of a luxury um, in countries where um, people have, uh, you know, perhaps what, what was possibly conceived of as, uh, as more pressing concerns around access to food and, uh, and, and clean water and things. But um, I think, you know, what, what we're all seeing um, currently is just that it, you know communicating um, is, uh, is is a fundamental human need. Yes, totally. I mean, if there's if there's one bright spot in the pandemic, it's definitely that you know we've seen more governments, more organizations, more companies uh, paying attention to the connectivity gap. And it's it's critical for governments and other organizations to build on this momentum and use this as an opportunity to accelerate our collective work to bring people online and just bridge this gap finally. Yeah, and, and I also think I, I think I, I think the pandemic has actually made a lot of regulators actually think outside of the box. So basically you have a lot of regulators now thinking, looking into different technologies they can actually use in bridging the digital divide. I know, you know, Fatima just talked about Mawingu using, you know, TV white space. Um, Kenya recently just um, gave um, Google approval to kind of fly their balloons over, over the country. So I think, you know, there are a couple of things going on right now. And I think, you know, the, um, the regulators are also looking into um, ways they can properly allocate this spectrum. And I think that has been some of the biggest issues, um, especially in this in this space in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, unfortunately, we're uh, we've reached uh, we've reached the our, our, our hour. Um, this has been a, a really amazing conversation. Um, I don't think we've solved um, the problems, but I, I really feel like you know we we have uh, we have highlighted some areas that that need to be uh, addressed. Um, possibly made some steps forward in categorizing the challenges that that, that are faced um, and yes had some really good examples of, uh, of of work that's going on in different sectors to 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 do some of this so i would urge um all of you to uh, to check out the resources that will be published in in pathable um we'll, we've got a, a link from Gennaro just now and um, also from Onika, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get some more information from Onika um, if you if you would like to follow up. So um, thank you very much to our our panel, um, um, Gennaro, Onika, Olu, and Fatima. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, I've been Duncan Drury from NetHope. Um, so uh, thank you very much to uh, Catholic Relief Services for putting on this wonderful conference. Um, and yeah, thank you to everybody who attended and asked questions today. Um, have thank a you. have a have a good day. All right, thank you, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Duncan. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Now. Bye.